Welcome back to Politicalish. This is uh, this is David Quintana, um, and today, today we have how should I put this? This is a really interesting story that so few people have heard of. Um, I heard about this um, honestly a couple of months ago um, when I was going through YouTube and I saw some people talking about Burger Records, and I was like, Burger Records? What is that? I haven't heard of this, and. Then I looked back and I found a story in the LA Times, which was a pretty amazing story about the the this just super rise of a of a record company called Burger Records, um, and then the even more spectacular fall. Um, Burger Records went from nothing in 2007 um, to the highest heights in the in the teens. And then to absolutely nothing in 2020, they do not exist. It, it was just an amazing 13 year ride for these guys. But the reason that they fell apart to me is even more amazing. And the reason why I'm surprised that more people don't know that's the story. So I want to, I want to use this episode to, to talk about the incredible rise and even more incredible demise of burger records and to do that i have with me the woman that actually wrote the story in the la times um la times editorial uh entertainment writer right is that what you do yep, yep. <clears throat> for la times um jessica gelt how are you hi good good i'm doing well thanks for having me yeah um welcome welcome to politicalish um this is again a story when i read your story in the times i was like wow <laughs> Why, how have I never heard about this? Why isn't this a bigger story? How come people aren't talking about burger records? Like they talk about some of the things that happen in the, in the movie industry. Right. Um, Cause I think you have all of the same elements there. Um, but anyway, we're going to get into that. So speaking of music though, I hear you're in a band right? <laughs> well, yeah. So that's partially why I was qualified to write this. I spent, mm -hmm. before I was an LA Times staff writer and even after, I spent years and years touring um, in a, in, with a couple of different rock bands. Um, I played bass and... Uh, oh my God, I knew you played bass. <laughs> I knew you did. I don't know why. I looked at you and I thought, bass player. I think I thought Tina Weymouth. Or Tina, <laughs> I'll take that. Heads. I will take that. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, she reminds me, I bet she played bass. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, you know, and, and I was in basically indie underground rock bands. So I, I know the scene well. I've toured a lot, you know, throughout this country. And um, we had a record label deal in Spain and toured all over there and have been um, encountered a ton of bands and a ton of backstages. And as I've often been, you know, the only woman in the room especially, you know, as a young woman when I was first coming up and I, you know, so I kind of know, I know a lot of the women I talk to for this story, I know where they're coming from. I know the scene really well. So, yeah. Well, okay. All right. Well, that's going to be really helpful, helpful for this conversation um, because um, a lot of this is a world that I'm not familiar with, which is that whole, and I guess they call it the DIY underground scene. And I, I'd like to talk a little more about that, you know, like, we're, we're not talking about fixing your kitchen underground scene, right? It's a DIY music underground scene. And again, and I find myself very, you know, I, I, I think I'm a student of music and this is one that I really haven't heard of. And when I looked over the names of the bands that were involved with Burger Records, like the only one that I even knew was Weezer and they weren't really, well, I don't know, did... They weren't a Burger band. They okay. were, so Burger... Um, became this sort of really prominent mm -hmm. festival producer essentially that's, right. and that's, uh -huh. that's really how they made their money yeah. because they got bands like Weezer who were huge to headline their festivals mm -hmm. um so no Weezer was not a burger band nor are they involved in any of the allegations in this story mm -hmm. but yeah so, they had lots of you know big bands that weren't necessarily on their label headlining their festivals mm -hmm. so the music that you played right or still are you still in a band um, not really. I, I it kind of uh, 
the pandemic kind of put an end to all of <laughs> Well, it, actually, I'm curious. So what does an entertainment writer write about during the pandemic? Like, what was the... Well, so I've written about all kinds of things um, throughout my career at the Times, but I'm primarily right now doing arts and culture writing. So okay. um, with a focus on theater. So I, and, and classical music. So I have been like cataloging the devastating effects of the pandemic on our, you know, arts producers here in Los Angeles. So from the close of like Center Theater Group and the Amundsen and the Music Center to the Hollywood Bowl shutting down for an unprecedented 13 months to the, you know, the LA Phil being devastated, like all of those things I have covered in in detail. It's been a, pr a really brutal year. Yeah, um, yeah, and they, in some that... ways I've been working harder than I ever have because these stories are so important and and big and 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 this burger story kind of came in the midst of all of that and okay. i think their fall was partially because of the pandemic too i think it kind of made the situation ripe for them oh fall. okay well we'll get it we'll, we will get into that then i i didn't mean to jump ahead but yeah so that's <laughs> i'm i i like that nexus there um by the way do you do you think there are some of these um iconic um, you know, halls and, and places of, of, of entertainment and music that won't be coming back that we will lose because of the pandemic? Well, not fortunately on a large scale, like, you know, Disney Concert Hall and the Ford and the Hollywood yeah. Bowl. I mean, they've ruptured yeah. the LA Phil, which runs the Hollywood Bowl, mm -hmm. um, has ruptured more than 105 uh, million dollars during the pandemic, but they're oh. coming back. So we're oh, not okay, going to lose we're not going to lose our big houses, but a lot of, you know, if you want to talk underground indie music, I mean, like the Troubadour was in grave danger. I don't know what's happening with that anymore. And a colleague of mine, August Brown at the paper who covers music has been covering these indie rock clubs, but a lot of the places where underground musicians played right. or came up mm -hmm. are in are in pretty grave danger from the pandemic. Okay. So they're, they're on life support right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. Uh. Not good to know, but I mean, I thank you for explaining that to me. Um, so, okay, let's talk about this whole DIY underground scene. So what is the DIY underground scene? Because that was the first thing I had to like break through when I was reading the story. Because again, I, I wasn't familiar with the names of the bands. I have kind of dabbled in some of the, uh, I looked some of them up on YouTube and actually wasn't that bad. I looked up the Buttertones. They have a song called Matador that I really like. And um, so I did. I did delve into it a little bit, but how would you describe what what the type of music that we're going to be talking about here? So it's funny that you were, you said you know DIY isn't kitchen uh, fixing your kitchen sink because so DIY do it yourself sort of stands for this sort of punk rock aesthetic where these bands weren't waiting for sort of mainstream acceptance they were kind of doing everything themselves to making their own flyers to promoting themselves to booking their own tours to just kind of creating a world of music unto themselves that became hugely popular. So it's like, even if you haven't heard of these bands in the mainstream, the the the, the people who were involved in this scene, I mean, this was th this was a way of life. So, and, and, and th that's a huge swath, swath of people, you know, a, a lot of underground kids, uh, kids who, uh, you know, identify with punk rock and indie rock and, and kind of an outsider ideal and aesthetic. Um, and in Burger Records really came to epitomize that for for Southern California youth, and you know, and even people, you know, and part of the problem was a lot of the fans were young, and a lot of the musicians were a lot older in their 30s and 40s, um, mm -hmm. you know. So that's where you kind of set up this sort of culture clash. And so this, by the way, this scene still exists, right? I mean, we're talking about the rise and fall of one label, um, uh, but but the scene still goes on. And how big is it? I mean, like, like if you were to talk about it, like how much of uh, of the music spectrum does this whole indie, you know, uh, underground scene? I might have a stilted view of it because it's been such a large part of my life through the years. But it's, I mean, it's huge. And, and, and you know, it's, you, you mentioned a band like Weezer, you know, Weezer came up in that world or a band like Green Day, uh, which right. is a massive band. They, they were sort of what any indie punk kid would be aspiring to be like in the, you know, okay. 90s. They were coming up in driving around and their parents were driving them to shows in a van you know they were just like little punk rock kids who played little punk rock venues and they were skaters so there are some massive bands that come out of this you know and and so you know you get to the top like bands like green day and weezer and then you get to the bottom you know with with smaller bands like you mentioned the butter tones like they weren't huge but they toured internationally 
you know, mm -hmm. they probably got a couple hundred kids at their shows and and could do that across the country. And that's no small feat for for if you're a small, you know, a smallish non-major label band. So in some ways, the scene's pretty huge. It extends across the globe. I mean, there's kids all over South America, Europe, Asia, everywhere that love this music. Yep. So, you know, it, it, again, it speaks to kind of the the, the, the sort of punk, punk aesthetic, you know, the underground outsider punk aesthetic. So that extends kind of everywhere in some ways. Where do they, where do they, where do they find the music? Because I'm, I'm finding, and I don't listen to the radio a lot any day, but anymore, but I don't know. I was thinking about it the other day, the demise of rock and the, you know, how alternative kind of disappeared. And, um, so where, where would you consume this music? Is it primarily a live product? Um, for the yeah, consumers? It, it, live is a huge part of it, and then like Berger released cassette tapes. I mean, right? What? Right? Like, Holy, but, don't, say, <laughs> don't don't skip ahead. <laughs> yes, that, I want to talk about that because they had a very uh, interesting uh, business model. <laughs> yeah, right. So cassette tapes, right? So yeah, it's is it's, so it's yeah, it's a it's the ultimate outsider deal, right? Yeah, because these are for kids who didn't grow up with cassette tapes, you know, like these are kids who, you know, had to go out of their way to find a cassette tape player because those aren't just anywhere anymore. Uh -huh. You know, the parents probably told them about them, you know, so it's not, so it was, th that gets to the sort of outsider thing, you know, vinyl, of course, I mean, vinyl is a huge thriving industry now, but it was pretty, you know, it's still niche, mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. vinyl, cassettes, you know, um, and then of course, in this day and age, like YouTube and in social media, huge for these bands, okay. you know, so you, you could release your own music through Bandcamp, you know, through YouTube, right. through Spotify, you know, whatever else, like and SoundCloud. Yeah. 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 So, but, but live is still a big part of it, which of course leads to a lot of the problems that we're going to, yeah. we're going to talk about that came up this whole live. And when you're talking about 30 year old men and 14 year old fans, you know, yep. that's, just a car crash waiting to happen. Right. So, so I know Burger Records was started in Fullerton, right? It was started by by um, Lee Rickard and Sean am I, Borman. Is that, yeah. Um, and is that is that the epicenter of this place? Is it the Orange County kids, or is that yeah, just I mean, it, to be where they were? It's largely Southern California. Their their the Burger scene was birthed in Southern California in OC. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot, you know, but the bands that they championed were definitely national, if not international, underground sensations. So they had really kind of had finger on the pulse of that whole scene. They, they, you know, and, and when they were formed in 2000, I think it was 2009, um, they, uh, that was kind of when this sort of bubblegum punk, surf rock, Kid, a lot of young musicians were looking back to the 70s to, to for their influences you know they were looking at like punk, punk and and sort of early you know uh, uh the, sort of that 70s rock and roll uh mm -hmm. that the gritty sort of so it was it went away from kind of like the shoegaze of the 90s into like a more sort of raucous punk aesthetic and 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 Berger and Borman and Ricard, the two men who founded Berger, really had tapped into that. They had a band called The Makeout Party, and it was very much this of, of that genre. And they originally started the label basically, again, in the DIY way. They were just like, we're going to put out our own band on this label. And then they, you know, began putting out other bands and, and then they became known. And anybody who was anybody wanted to be on Berger if you were in that scene. Yeah, you know, I would, again, some of the songs that I was listening to, they are some of the you know music that I was listening to, they sounded a little like the whole Black Flag, mm -hmm. um, you know, that whole scene there. And like they were just bringing that up right to the new day. Yeah. And they, they borrowed a lot on those archetypes. Um, and G, even like Gigi Allen, because some of these artists are really, you know, seeing how far they can push that envelope, you know, performing almost nude. Yep. Um, so I think they were going back to even some of those like sh those mid '70s shock guys, right? Um, yes. Oh God, who's the guy that never ages? Pop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I don't, has he aged yet? No. He's always no. looked the same. He always will. <laughs> <laughs> it's all those drugs, man. They like they, they keep you. I don't know. Plasticine. Um, <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. All right. So so they were the kings of Orange County, but you're saying that this was everywhere, right? This yeah. Oh, is yeah. currently everywhere and even international. Yep. Okay. So do major major labels are they are they involved in this stuff too? So yeah, but but to the extent, like I said, that like Weezer or or Green Day would end up, you know, it, the the bands that would break out would end up on on larger labels, and um, you know, like to to a lesser extent, Sub Pop isn't considered a major label, but it's massive. I mean, it's it might as well be. It's like if you're gonna be big in indie, Sub Pop is where you want to be, and so Sub Pop in Seattle, you know, definitely ha- has a lot of these bands, not not burger bands, but a lot of they kind of mm-hmm. champion that underground indie aesthetic too. So that actually, they actually became a, a name. I've noticed it was actually there was actually called Burger Bands and Burger, like they were a they thing. They were a brand, yeah, they were, yeah. They were a brand. They did an amazing job at that. And so, what was their background? I mean, did they come from a from a marketing background and music background? Um, so uh, Richard know, and Borman. Neither one of them. By the time that I was writing the story, Burger had already been taken down, and. Um, they were neither one of them wanted to comment for the story so i never got to know them um i only know what i've read of them and you know my sense is that they you know they were music lovers i mean real music lovers like lived breathed music um had their own band i think borman was uh, in graphic design which had a lot to do with burger success because they had this they had a a really cool marketing scheme and and their logo was really cool and you know kind of in those you know old kind of old school punk flyer vein you know just like cool graphic design and sort of cut and paste and very bright and colorful and you know youthful vibes so he he was really good with marketing and branding yeah yeah i mean if you're going to go for that era you got to get something that'll look good on a pin yeah. Right? <laughs> that, yeah. That like the kids can wear on their, on their, uh, you know, retro jackets and stuff. <laughs> like I remember when I was young, that was the thing, man. Um, I didn't do it. Um, so, all right. So they create Burger Records, which is an actual record store in, in Fullerton. Right. And I was yeah. reading that they'd like, I mean, they didn't have any money. Um, they were just a couple of bros that had an idea. I take right. it. I mean, am I far off on that? No, that's that's about right. In fact, they were like basically living out of the shop when they first, you know, because they they started the label and a couple of years later they opened the shop and they sold a lot of their cassettes out of it and other music and and they were like washing their hair out of an, under a spigot out back, like they were like living there, you know, They're sleeping was, in the shop and taking showers out of a spigot yep. in the alley. Yep, amazing. Those those a couple guys that believe in their shit right there, yeah. man. Yeah, like, nah, we're gonna make it. Let's <laughs> it someday. Um, okay, okay. So here's what I find most interesting in your story is that they didn't actually sign bands. Like they didn't have like you know when you're thinking a label, you're thinking of Def Jam, right? Or or one of these guys, and you go out, you have an A and R guy. He goes out, he's like, hey, I can make you a star. Signs you to a 360 deal. You know, and you know, you're, we're going to put your albums out. We're going to, you know, get them distributed. No, that wasn't their deal, right? They did not sign artists, so they weren't like I think they weren't really tied to the development of this artist. Um, they didn't have to have. I don't think they had the sunk costs that a lot of these record labels have, which and they yeah. do these 360 deals because now they got to make the money in every possible way back. They had a pretty interesting business model. You want to you want to talk about that? How Burger Records did this? Yeah, so Borman had said that he didn't like um, contracts. So you... Oh, that's if, interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. if you were a burger band, you know, he would like email you or call you up and say, I like your music. And, you know, can, you want to put out a cassette on burger. And you might put out a cassette. You might put out two cassettes. You weren't tied to any deal, though. So a lot of burger bands were actually signed to other indie labels. Right. And, you know, we're doing the business of like, making music with other labels and doing the contractual work and, you know, getting maybe a small fee, you know, like indie musicians don't make much, but you know, when a indie label wants to put out your music, they'll usually give you a few thousand dollars. But Burger wasn't really like that. They were just kind of like, you, you know, we'll put out a, a tape for you and it'll be awesome. And then the hard work was of like cultivating and nurturing and, you know, bringing up a band was done left to other labels, really. Yeah. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you was like, how, 
how did that happen? Because I know most of the people that are assigned to labels, right? The contract, again, as I mentioned, referenced earlier, it's a 360 contract. So they own every single aspect of your artistic endeavor. Um, how was Berger able to go and, you know, get all these side gigs with these guys that were signed to other labels? Yeah. So, yeah. So again, indie musicians are just really hungry and they, anytime they're offered, you know, uh, an opportunity to get their music out there, that's kind of a huge, a huge thing. Ultimately, you know, people are looking to be seen and heard and, you know, there's so many bands out there competing for the, what, you know, meager exposure is available to, to, the hordes of people making music. And so Berger with their street cred and their reputation, um, if they came to you and said, you know, can we put out a cassette of your music, but we're not gonna give you really anything except for the cassette, you're <laughs> you say, that. okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's not a hard gig when you're dealing with indie musicians who are just, you know, hungry for anything. Oh man. And so and so I think uh over the 13 years that they were in existence, I think it was 13, right? Or no? Am I wrong? Yeah, yes, 13 years. Yeah. Yeah, they dealt with over 1200 bands. Um I think that was in your story. So, I mean, people were lining up, right, to be a yep. burger band. Yep. For the <laughs> freaking cassettes. <laughs> That's what gets me. Like <laughs> I didn't even know they made that many cassettes anymore, man. But they they were they were selling cassettes, huh? Yeah, it's a it was it's a thing that it really is, and people buy them and they collect them and they love them and they wow. listen to them. <laughs> this has been so eye opening. My um, band has cassettes. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Your band has cassettes. <laughs> God dang it. It's so funny because like, you know, people say, oh, nice one, Boomer. But I'm like, dude, don't call me Boomer. You're using my shit. Yeah, it <laughs> was me. with cassettes. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, all right. So so it's happening quick, right? I mean, 13 years, they, they opened their doors, 2009. Things are moving. Things are fast. I think in 2014, they actually... Um, Yves Saint Laurent used their music right on a runway show. So, think, I mean, these these guys had just a rocket ride to the top. Oh yeah. Um, and, and so, I think what we want to kind of talk about now is what was happening while this rocket ride was going on. Oh, oh, the other thing though is that in addition to the music, and I'm sorry, Jessica, but in in addition in addition to the music, they were having the festivals, right? Yeah, and I think that's where you want to ask what how they made money the mm -hmm. that's how the festivals were how they made money because the festivals were huge there were two three-day affairs there was a uh, burger a go-go which sort of honored female fronted bands and then there was burgerama which was just this giant festival and, and you know there'd be dozens and dozens of bands including like weezer and ariel pink and fiddler and like bands that you know were, were really big and so they could charge i don't know how much they were charging for tickets but i i, I a significant amount i'm sure in, in like I wish I knew the number, um, but they, that would have been their bread and butter. And they were doing a lot of festivals and the festivals got really big. Okay. Like how big, how big were the festivals? Yeah. I mean, it was, th they would, they would have thousands of fans at these things. I don't, I'm not sure if I got to exactly how big they were, but. Okay. But that was, so they were having yeah. like thousands of folks show up at their festivals. Yeah. And that was their real bread and butter. Yeah. Yeah. That's where they would have been making their money. Okay. So uh, were they making money? I mean, I do have that question. Like, were they actually making money or was it just kind of coming in, going out? I was never able to get my hands on like financial records for them. So I don't know. Um, I don't think they got like crazy rich off this. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why when the allegations began to stack up and there was a pandemic and they couldn't hold, hold uh, festivals and other things, they folded like that so yeah. I, I i don't think that this was like nobody was getting crazy rich on this but they were making a living and they were you know they were they were indie kings they were indie king i think they probably got more out of it personally like yeah. being the guy yeah i'm, I'm the burger right right um yep. And so, so we have these festivals and who, who do you think, what, what's the typical fan, like the age of the fans and like, where are they drawn? Cause I'm thinking like when I was reading the story, I was thinking of the same people that were kind of drawn to the Smiths 
right? These kind of outsider emo types, you know, and they're, they're laying in their room playing the cassette over and over and over and over. And, and that's what I was picturing. I mean, how wrong am I? Did you have some of those like emo outsider types or were there like skater types? Yeah. Kind of like skater, skater, kind of punk outsider, you know, people who didn't identify with the sort of mainstream people who, who for whatever reason, you know, felt like they looked at life a little bit differently. They didn't identify with, you know, with, with the w- whatever was big and hot at the time in pop music. You know, they weren't going to love Lady Gaga and, and, you know, they, it was just a different kind of kid. And oftentimes, you know, lo- some, some loners, but they found a real identity in the scene. I mean, the, you know, people, you know, there a lot of, bad things happened but a lot of good things happened too you know there was a lot of community and Mm -hmm. you know music and art and you know in this scene with you know thousands and thousands of musicians and thousands and thousands of fans you know a lot of them were really good you know good people doing Mm -hmm. good things and there was you know a kind of love and community there that people found. So. so there was an emotional tie to the music and to the musicians that were putting this music out. And I think a, a lot of the fans were young women. Um, many, many of the fans, um, like young, I mean, young, like 14, 15, uh, like we we're talking about the Smiths, right? In the eighties. I mean, it's that same, they're looking for something and for that acceptance. And he sings to me, right. Which, which creates a kind of an interesting power imbalance, right. Between the fan and the performer, um, as we see in the movie industry and as we, you know, we're going to talk about now here. So they're making these, you know, the festivals are the bread and butter. So you have all of these fans coming many, many, many of them that are very young women who are, you know, in, coming with their other girlfriends who write or are engaging in the scene. Um, and then on stage, you have these, these, these musicians who tend to be in their mid twenties, early thirties, you know, they've been, playing in their garage for a long time in the cul-de-sac out there in Fullerton. And now they're getting their chance to be on stage and, and have the young women, you know, waving to them from the audience. And so what happens as we move into this festival and the interaction of these fans with the musicians and where did this start to go wrong? So there's two key places. Um, and it's among men and women in the bands um, where women in bands came forward and started to say that they had been sexually groomed and preyed upon by other men in bands. And then there were the fans, uh, mostly young teenagers, um, you know, age ranging, you know, from 14 to 17 and 18, um, who met these men either backstage or who posted things on Instagram um, about their fandom and then were approached by these men through social media um, and essentially groomed um, and, and you know, entered in, you know, some statutory rape situations um, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, sexual harassment, uh, sexual assault. Um, yeah, just older men basically preying on younger women. And again, it wasn't like, across the board right. but it happened enough that sure. you know i interviewed two dozen women for this story who had eerily similar stories you know and you know that if you've got two dozen women who are coming forward and talking to you you know that there are many 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 more you know um so that's that's where it started so you're in a band right or you've been in bands for a long time you're a bassist and um do you find some of that same element in music in general with women in bands and women in music? Yes. So that's, uh, that's what I, you know, I was thinking about this and I thought about this a lot when I was writing it and this, this kind of behavior can be traced back to, you know, the beginning of sort of rock and roll, that idea of, of groupie culture, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think like you think back, I mean, think about the album cover for like Led Zeppelin's Houses of the Holy Mm -hmm. and like everything you've heard about like teen girls backstage with them or with David Bowie or- That we laugh about, right? Yes, yes. We lionize them for that behavior. Yes, and so that's kind of where it started and it was unhealthy then and it's unhealthy now, but it was sort of this through line of rock and roll culture, this idea of women and young girls were groupies and they were there 
you were a rock god and you were a man and women were going to be falling all over you. And if they were falling all over you, they wanted you sexually. And therefore you were doing no harm by returning their, their adoration and their love. Um, but when, you know, a girl is 15 or 16, she may be in love with her rock god, but it doesn't mean she wants to send nudes of herself. And it doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> that she knows what she's doing, you know, when suddenly she's being asked for a sexual relationship and she's complying, but she's not necessarily feeling good about it. You know, she is not, mm -hmm. she knows she shouldn't be, she doesn't feel good, but she doesn't feel like she can say no. You know, you get into some real gray, complex areas here. And a lot of women who started to come out when they were in their twenties about these experiences in their teens were saying like, I didn't feel good about it. I didn't feel right about it. He took advantage of me. I feel, I feel like I was groomed. I feel like I was preyed upon. And at the time I was too young and naive and fragile to understand it. And only later did I sort of come to terms with what happened and how it was in a, how, how inappropriate it was, you know, so that's why you don't come across a lot of, um, you know, police reports in this world. It's just a lot of sort of, it's like a reckoning you know, where, where, every, you know, people are looking at the culture of rock and roll and how it became this sort of masculine, you know, <laughs> kind of rodeo in some ways with, with women just along for the ride. And, and it just, you know, in this particular scene, but I, I think across the board, you'll find it, I think it can be quite unhealthy. Yeah. I mean, as I was reading your story and, um, it was in the LA times, um, how long, when, when did your story run? Jan, I think late January, January. Yeah. Of this year. Um, and if anybody, you know, wants to Google that it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing read. Um, and, and, and even if you watch this, you should read it because she goes into details, right. That we probably won't go into here necessarily just because of time. Um, but it seemed like a lot, I, I found two things pretty interesting. One is that one of the instruments that really helped spread this was social media um, that helped like the whole burger scene, right? Spread was people got together because like you said, they created a community and that community oftentimes came together on Instagram, right? Or on, you know, I don't know if those kids use Facebook, but um, a lot of the story dealt with Instagram. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so basically what happened then is that on Instagram, um, a young woman named Casey Red, who had um, been groomed by a 20, when she was 17, a 29 year old man named uh, Phil Selena, who was in a band called Love Cop. Um, she, he had contacted her through social media back when she was a teenager and invited her to a show at Burger. And she, you know, drove to the show and he asked her to meet him in her car in the parking lot and then directed her to drive to like a dark neighborhood and, and had sex with her in the back seat. And it happened one other time. And then, you know, he solicited her for nudes and, you know, but prior to that, he was like a drug and addiction counselor. And she had had a history of a problematic history in her life um, oh. with family members. And she really trusted him. And she said to me, you know, that he was the only person that she felt heard by, the adult that she felt safe with. So, you know, his behavior really, really was uh, predatory in her eyes and, um, and, and really harmful. And she, over the years, as she was coming to terms with it, you know, became more and more aware that she was far from alone in, in these situations. And, you know, some of the stories that I heard that were not for the record were, were you know, of violent rapes and other things that were, you know, pretty graphic that women didn't, didn't want to talk to, to put their names to. Um, so the, the, the spectrum is wide for the experiences that different women had, but Casey knew about a lot of these things. And, um, she, the, a, a woman named Clementine, Clementine Creevy, who was part of a very popular burger band called Cherry Glazer, came in July of last year and accused um, the lead singer of uh, The Growlers um, of, or I don't know if he was lead singer, a, a, a guy named Sean Redman, who was also in her band of having a, you know, of beginning a sexual relationship with her when she was 14 and he was in his 20s. And she kind of came out and she was a really popular, is a really popular musician. And that kind of went viral. So after, after she went, came out, Casey saw that and just thought, I can't, 
live with this anymore. Something needs to be said. And she started an Instagram page called Lured by Burger Records, where she, and it, it was run anonymously at first. And she started posting anonymous accusations from women about what had happened. And that Instagram page just blew up. And, you know, thousands and thousands of people were looking at it. And it obviously touched a nerve because her inbox started just being flooded with stories. I mean, story after story after story after story. And it did end up becoming kind of a national news story. Rolling Stone picked it up, the LA Times, we picked it up early on that summer before I did kind of the deep dive. Um, and, you know, Pitchfork, which is a huge music site, picked it up. And this is the summer of 2020. So five days after she launched Lured by Burger and all of these stories just started coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out, uh, Burger literally just shut down all operations. They pulled everything off their, they, no online presence, just gone, 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 over. Like 13 years of Done. this like legendary record, just over. That was what I found was the one of the most shocking parts of your whole story is that these guys had, you know, 1300 bang, you know, 1200 bands over 13 years used by fashion houses on the runway five freaking days. So six days before that, you know, uh, Rickard and, and Borman woke up and go, life is good, right? <laughs> six yeah. days later, they do not exist. Like, yeah. Zero. Yeah. Gone. And in the, but you have to realize that was six days with like 10 years of lead up, you know, so it never would have happened if the stories weren't so bad and so many, you know, it was like there was just story after story after story that started to come out and it was seemed like and, and, and then men in the band started making apologies, um, you know, basically admitting to, to the behavior. You know, like there was a, a popular sort of uh, underground musician called No Bunny um, who like said, I'm never going to play music again. I abused young teenage. I used my position as a rocker to abuse women and young teens and I'm done. And so that started to happen too. So it wasn't just like men weren't saying like, what are you talking about? We never did this. They were saying, uh, sorry, I didn't, you know, like, so it became really messy really quickly. Um, and, you know, nobody was trying, like Casey will tell you, she wasn't trying to, you know, I know cancel culture is such a hot button issue right now. She wasn't like, nobody was trying to shut the record label down. If anything, Casey wanted them to sort of have a reckoning, you know, in, in some ways she felt betrayed that they just pulled everything off. You know, she wanted them to say, we're sorry, here, here are the steps we're going to take to try and clean up this scene, to make amends, to, uh, to help heal, you know, and instead they just, they just said, we're done, we're, you know, and, and so in some ways, the women who were calling out this bad behavior felt cheated, you know, they wanted more, they wanted better. Well, it's a, it's a guy that doesn't even believe in contracts, right? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, you know what I mean? He doesn't like, it's what it, you know, I, that's kind of, the the behavior i guess the fact that it shut down is shocking but i guess then when you scrape away the guy and look at the guys who actually run the label you're like okay yeah, i guess i get it they're like we don't want to deal with this um it, was that kind of what they did like we just don't even want to deal i think they took one attempt right to try and they put a woman in charge yes like, oh look we're gonna and then they were just like oh fuck it we're out yeah they they were going to like try yeah they they put a woman named justice zapper gray in charge mm -hmm. briefly and she very quickly came under fire people were like what are you doing why are you defending them mm -hmm. you know and so she like stepped back pretty quickly and then they went under so it all happened very quickly you know and and they had contacted casey and they were kind of like you know we're sorry what can we do you know um but she also felt that they weren't approaching it from a place where they were really acknowledging what had happened because you know she was saying on lured by burger that the burger record shop was actually a nexus for a lot of the abuse they had a back room there oh and, can you talk about that because I, yeah i don't so know if i read about that yeah at the shop in fullerton they had this back room where people would hang out and drink and smoke weed and um mm -hmm. and young girls 
it came out a lot on the Lord by Burger site were being invited back there and being given alcohol and drugs and were hit on and you know sexualized and so a lot of that was happening at Burger. I don't know, you know, if Sean and Lee, the Burger founders, were involved directly in that. You know how much they knew about it. I just don't know. You know, I it, their shop. I you know you would think, but I, I don't, I don't know to the extent I don't, but that was happening. And there were a lot of accusations of that happening. And then similarly, you know, at shows that they would hold backstage, apparently some of, you know, many of my sources said that women would be backstage being given drugs, being given alcohol. I mean, teenagers, you know, by older men, you know, freaking out on drugs, being soothed by these older men, um, you know, being, so it was, it was a very unhealthy dynamic. And that was pretty much, I mean, at least from what I read in your story and some of the other stories that I've, that I've seen on it, um, it, 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 that seemed to be the model. It was, you know, older men, right. With these positions of not authority, but where the women, the, the, the fans looked up to them. Right. And a teenage in many cases, very young teenage. I'm not I like, I, I don't think I read a lot that were 18 or 19. I think I, a lot of the ones that you talked about were, you know, at the lower end of the teenage yeah. spectrum. And it was a lot of the, of preying on them at the shows, at the festivals and using social media to circle back right to them on the Instagram, which yeah. again, I, I think was, is interesting because I think, you know, the same media that created burger records and brought them to this machine um, actually ended up creating the behavior that brought them down. Um, so, it, did, but but though, did that seem to be the model? The you know the older men and these very very young uh, fo- women that yeah. they would meet at the yeah young young and and vulnerable you know girls who who had you know oftentimes carried a little tr- bit of trauma already from previous experiences difficult families you know who were looking for acceptance and support founded in these older men who they befriended and you know, were open to these men to the extent that the, that they were able to like be taken advantage of essentially, you know, because they idolized these guys and these guys, you know, took, took advantage of that. You know, you just think about what a 14, 15, 16 year old girl is like, or looks like, and then being in your twenties and, and, and deciding to take that to a sexual place. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's really not acceptable. And, and, and no matter how much you might yeah, I mean, it, so yeah, these these women, you know, these young women were were really taken advantage of in ways that were incredibly harmful and, and painful. Did Rickard and Borman did they try to make excuses or did they try to explain? Yeah. Them? So Borman gave one interview to a radio station in Seattle. I think it was KXCP, and um, he uh, basically said, like, I can't be like the policeman of rape. Like if I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to, when I sign a ban, I don't ask them. And I think this is almost a direct quote. I don't ask them like, did you rape somebody? You know, like he basically was like, that's not what I got any music for. I can't be expected to police that. I can't be, you know, and the women were saying, well, but you can be expected to kind of like hold men accountable when this behavior comes to the forefront. And also to, uh, you know, obviously like operate your record shop in a way where there's not, that's not happening in your back room. Yeah. I, you know, I think one of the young women, and I don't remember who it is, you might, had a really great quote and I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't remember the exact quote. And I think the audience should understand that the burger festivals were all ages. They were all age shows. So they were all age festivals. They were all age concerts, right? You, there was yeah. no, and, and they still had like alcohol and everything else. Very was very prevalent. I saw a lot of pictures, you know, of these young, young girls just passed out with like, you know, all the alcohol around them. So, so they were known for being, for holding festivals that had all ages. And so one of the young women was like, well, if you're going to be having, you know, young, you know, a young, uh, what did she say? Do you know the quote I'm going to be using? Where she said something like, "If you're oh, gonna, have- yeah, if you're gonna have all ages shows, um, with yeah, with young girls, like check your creepy friends at the door." Yes, right. <laughs> check your creepy <laughs> yeah. friends at the door. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, that says it right there. Yes, you don't. You, you know, you can't do a criminal background check on everybody you sign. But if you're gonna be having kids at the freaking places, make sure you don't have creeps there, man. And um, it sounds like they didn't. You know, 
at least from what he said, you know, that wasn't his bag. Right. Yeah. So he, yeah, he didn't really, it didn't seem that he was taking accountability ser too seriously in this case. He just felt like how on earth, you know, his, his, he seemed to be throwing up his hands. Like, how can I, how, how am I supposed to, to deal with this? You know? And, and it was, and, and that goes to like, you know, club owners too. I mean, you know, a lot of club owners, I think don't realize or don't care to realize what might be happening backstage, you know? And, and that's another problem. Like there's no safe places. Music is, is, is because music is supposed to be so wild and free and and you know out there i think oftentimes really bad behavior gets brushed under the rug because it's like it's it's rock and roll you know where it's it's sort of this crazy free-flowing thing but when you think about clubs especially all ages clubs there should be people backstage watching out that's right for, yeah for kids you know that you, you you should have that and mm -hmm. and you know not policing them but watching out for them you know, right. making sure that they have a safe space that they're taking care of, that there's somebody there making, you know, it, and, and that's not, that's not really prevalent and it should be. And, and if I were to do a follow-up story, I think that would be the story, like what's happening at clubs. At and the all ages clubs. Make, yeah. How do we make yeah. safe spaces for, for, for people at clubs? What does happen at an all age club? How, 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 are, how are all age clubs policed? And I don't mean actual police, but you know, how are, how are they supervised? They aren't really. I mean, usually they're, you know, places that don't make a lot of money. There's like a promoter and maybe somebody who's running the space and they're often mm -hmm. in an office somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like fans and musicians kind of running, running around the space, you know, and that's what makes them fun. It makes it fun for a kid to go there, you right. know, but when there's predatory behavior happening and there aren't safe places and, you know, the, yeah, I mean, I think it can go bad very quickly. You know, and definitely, you know, when I used to play at all ages clubs, I mean, there were, you know, drugs and alcohol anywhere, everywhere, even though there wasn't supposed to be. Right. You know, so They're everywhere. Yeah, it's there and that's probably going to happen. But again, you need to set up safe spaces. You need to make sure that there's somebody there who's taking care of people, who is watching out for people. So why do you think that I never heard about this until <laughs> I read your story? <laughs> like, well, why is that? Y you know, you're always going to hear about the really big Mm -hmm. you know, big pot famous, you know, the, the Ryan Adams scandal or Michael Jackson or R. Kelly, or, you know, you're going to hear about the, the really big ones, but in this, you know, didn't fall into that, you know, a lot of the bands, you know, we could list 10 of them and, you know, maybe right. none of your listeners would even know mm -hmm. who these bands were. And that's part of the problem, you know, so we're going to pay attention to the big heavy hitters who do the real bad things and and a lot of the other stuff goes falls by the wayside, you know, but it's happening. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I just found that amazing. I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of young of young women who are, are alleging sexual assault and predatory behavior um, by people associated with one label or not label, well, one entity. And I never heard of it until I read your story. Just, <laughs> I was like, wow. And maybe you're right. Maybe it's because the only band I had heard of was a band that wasn't even associated with them. It was just played at one of their festivals, Weezer, right. right? I never heard of any of these other bands, right? And that's a shame that in order for this to get attention, it has to either be like on a label like Def Jam or it has to be by someone who has had a hit, right? Yeah. In yeah. the last 10 years. That's a shame because that behavior that was associated with, with the burger scene is just horrendous. It's horrific. And yeah. I mean, what do you think? What's your take? I mean, you wrote the story. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the story did get a lot of readers and a lot mm -hmm. of, um, of, you know, positive feedback. And a lot of women contacted me who wanted to say, thank you. Unfortunately, a lot of women contacted me who wanted to say me too. I got so uh. many emails after, you know, um, and that is still happening, you know, months, months after I wrote this story. Um, and that's pretty chilling. And I think that will continue to happen until, I mean, can this kind of behavior be rooted out and, and, and made to go away by the time, you know, four and five year olds are grown women? I, I don't know the answer to that. I hope so. You know, I hope that this story and the awareness even that you're giving to it and others, you know, make it something that goes away. I don't know that it ever totally does, 
you know, but that's why we keep talking about it and writing about it and exposing it, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's kind of, you know, one of the things that I thought about was I'm, I'm, it's awesome that, you know, Berger shut down in a freaking five days, which is unbelievable. What were they ever accused of anything? Um, so behavior? not the two owners besides being sort of, they were accused of very much protecting and being complicit in what was happening. Um, and I, other than that, I, I'm not certain that they were actually called out in particular. Um, Lee might have been, but I don't know the particulars of that. Uh, I don't think it ever was vetted. It wasn't something that I was able to vet through the times. And, you know, um, so we, you know, I, we didn't publish any accusations against them. Do you think they knew what was happening? Do you think they, they knew and turned a blind eye? Or do you think they knew and I, said you it know, was fine? I have no idea. I mean, I feel like it would be impossible to not have some sense of it. You know, I, I, I just feel like it would be, you know, it was such, it, it was a big scene, but it was also a small scene, you mm -hmm. know? So I think whatever kind of culture that existed there, my feeling is that they, you know, fostered it, were a part of it. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, you know, I can't say I wasn't there, you know, and, and if I had talked to them and I haven't, and I didn't talk to them. Okay. Yeah. They weren't talking, right? Yeah. They didn't go on the record. So, so these artists, they were already with other labels by and large, right? I mean, so, because as we mentioned before, Burger had an interesting, you know, business model. They didn't sign, they didn't sign acts. Yeah. They kind of borrowed acts off of other labels. So those guys, I guess, just went back to their labels unless they were the label. I mean, some of them probably paid a price, right? Yeah. No, a lot of the bands, most of the bands who were publicly accused ended up getting dropped by their other labels. Oh, okay, good. So, yeah. So a lot of the people, yeah, a lot of these bands either don't exist anymore or are trying to regroup in other ways and, you know, um, <laughs> form new bands, come up in other ways you know, hopefully have learned and will never behave that way again, you know, mm -hmm. but I, you know, yeah, I mean, it's tough because there aren't like, you know, there aren't the repercussions beyond being dropped and, and being publicly shamed there, you know, this isn't like a story about lawsuits and about like criminal proceedings. It's just, you know, a story about social media and how it was able to expose people's mm -hmm. bad behavior. Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, I am not the biggest fan of social media. In fact, I'm going to be doing a show pretty soon <laughs> about Facebook and the, the evil that it is. Um, but, but in this case, it actually worked. I mean, it did. It really worked. That, that lured by Burger, um, yeah. that site just exploded. Yeah. And I think Casey said she would, for the first week, she was spending 18 hours a day, right? Just yep. reading all those stories and all the people going, me too. Hey, that happened to me too. Hey, I got a story for you. Yep. So in this case, you know, it, it really did work, I think, for the best. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really, you know, and 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 she was really brave. She was she was incredibly brave to put that out there, to kind of take on sort of the the emotional labor of of vetting all of these stories and putting them out there and becoming really the face of of the sort of the resistance to to what was happening at Berger and the face, uh, you know, for people who were saying enough, like this can't be allowed to continue. Do you still talk to her? Is she doing okay? Um, you know, I haven't spoken to her, but I, I, you know, I will check in with her, and I, I mm -hmm. think she is doing okay. I after the story ran, you know, we did speak, and and she felt relief, and and um, you know, she she wants to heal. You know, she wants mm -hmm. to move on with her life. She's a an animal rights activist and a vegan and and sort of a just a a, a smart um thoughtful young woman and i think she's got just a lot of good things ahead of her and she, yeah. she wants to heal and move on yeah you know she's somebody's daughter yeah and it's, it's really it's really yeah if you read the story it's really horrific what uh, what happened in that in that specific case what she what she went through and and the predatory behavior by someone who came from that same um, who came from a place where I think she had an innate trust yeah. in him. And instead he used what he learned in that area to actually, you know, prey upon her. Yeah. Um, so what was, um, you look back on this and all the things you read, all the, I mean, all the things you, you, you heard and the people you talked to, like, is there anything that stands out the most from you from this story that you're like, God, how did that happen? Or uh, just, just that, 
I guess just the ex how how the behavior was somehow accepted, you know, just how if you were an older guy and you were, you know, hitting on a young teenager, how somehow that was like all cool, you know, I just <laughs> that that to me was just, you know, I know that that exists and that happens, but it just seems like that should be immediately just like, no, 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 you don't do that. You know, like your bandmates, you know, your bandmates tell you, you don't do that. Like the guys at the club tell you, you don't do that. Like, and they didn't, right? No, no. And that's, that to me was the, the, you know, like that, that's still, how, how is that happening? How is that allowed to happen? Yeah. You know? I, I mean, the, I, I was trying to think of a title for it. And the only thing I could think of was, it was just this, there was a toxic bro culture, you know, mm -hmm. that was just created this toxic bro and they were just, no one saw anything wrong with what the other bro did. Yeah. And that was, that was pretty bad. Um, so the acceptance of it all is really what. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just that it was allowed to go on for so long and that people seemed to be okay with it where, you know, nothing was okay about that. But, but don't you, in sometimes, you know, in reading your story, I, I was like, I think a lot of these guys are thinking this is the role I'm supposed to fill. Now, let me be really clear here. I'm not, I'm not excusing anybody at all because this behavior, as I've said many times, was horrendous. But I wonder if some of these people who go into music think, oh, now I have to act this way, right? This is the role I'm supposed to play. And, and you look back at some of the people that, again, we have lionized in music like Elvis Presley, and you go back, I mean, Elvis Presley, the women that he were he was dating, even what what is his, her name? The woman he married, Priscilla. Yeah, Priscilla. I mean, she was like a kid. Yeah, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis is married to a teenager, but we don't talk about that, right? I mean, I don't know. I haven't heard anybody talk about it. And you look at um, there are th things about St Steven Tyler, Led Zeppelin, and how they would just you know they had certain predilections that no one calls out. It just seems to be accepted as part, as part of that deal. I mean, do you yeah. think that plays a role in this sometimes? Yes, absolutely. I think that's where it all started. You know, it, that, that's the beginning of sort of the acceptance of this and it just built from there, you know, and anybody getting to rock and roll music, looking up to those guys thought, yeah, that's, that's what you do. You have like a pretty young thing by your side and and in your world and you're thinking she's always compliant and she always you know and, and and that's the problem is this idea of what women want is put upon them and what they want is rarely what men think they want you know and and you know w women by and large do not want to be sexualized they don't enjoy it they don't they're looking for friendship acceptance partnership you know um but that the, the sort of sexualization is not, you know, what women, mm -hmm. even, you know, so-called groupies are looking for. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Just crazy. So, um, what a ride. Um, <laughs> again, it was a rocket ride to the top, but it was a straight drop to the bottom for, for burger. And I guess it was good, but these folks are still out there. Right. I mean, a lot of this behavior, do you think you can kill a label, but I don't know if you can kill this behavior or do you think yeah. you can? Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I think there's a lot of work to be done and the more exposure, the more we talk about it, the more we write about it, mm -hmm. the more women just feel comfortable speaking up about it, you know, and saying like, this did happen to me and, and I'm, you know, and, and, and aren't made to feel ashamed, aren't, you know, are just heard. The more I think we get to a place where it's no longer acceptable where if you're the person doing it, somebody says, no, you can't, don't do that. Don't mm -hmm. do that. You know? Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, again, maybe a show like this and others um, can help publicize what happened there so we can learn some lessons from this. Sure. Is there any lesson we could take from this, from the whole burger debacle? I mean, it's going to sound maybe sort of cheesy and cliched, but you know, just, respect you know respect for your fellow humans treating people with dignity and kindness and compassion and you know when you see bad behavior call it out say something be supportive be be loving you know don't take advantage of you know i mean it just i think it just speaks to like you know 
be a good person, you know, <laughs> do your best to be a good person and to, to help and not hurt, you know, and I just feel like if we could somehow master that as a species, right, the world would be so much better. But, you know, if we can master that in rock and roll, like maybe this wouldn't happen to girls. Yeah, maybe we can avoid another burger records. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we can have people describe things as burger records in the future. Like, damn, right. <laughs> it's like a burger records. Just Becomes so we keep it. Adjective for <laughs> stuff yeah. here. Right, right. We'll keep, we'll, we'll create an adjective out of burger records and your story, you know, really goes a long way to do that. Um, if I could have you kind of sum up that whole scene maybe in in one sentence right i know that might be hard but if you could sum it up the whole burger scene the whole debacle the horrific shit that happened there if you could sum up what you learned and like one description of this like in one sentence could you oh gosh that's a tough one i mean just like when when an urge for you know art and connection goes terribly wrong you know goes mm -hmm. goes south goes you know obviously this was born out of the music was born out of a need to create art to connect to you know some of our loftier ideals you know and it just went wrong you know it went bad oh, well put well put and your story was amazing i hope everyone can read it you really you i hope you know very often very seldom you could read a story and go, hey, you know, I think after reading it and, and, and reflecting upon it, I think this could actually help save lives. And I think your story did because there might have been a lot of people that read your story who said, whoa, I might be in that situation right now. And maybe I should think about this twice. And I think your story did that. Um, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on, um, you know, Jessica Gelt with L.A. Times. Um, you want to read her story on Burger Records, um, the amazing rise and the even faster demise of a really, really bad place. And thank you so much for being on here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You got it. Bye-bye. Bye. She paints her eyes as black as night now. Pulls those shades down tight. Yeah, I guess a smile.